redeemed uh, manhood. Uh, tonight, we are not going to have any music tonight, so um, I'll just open up in a word of prayer, and we're going to open the word together, all right? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have uh, to gather together tonight as men. I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to mold us into the men uh, that you want us to be, uh, mold us into the image of Christ. He is the ultimate man, and so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, work on our hearts, Lord. I pray that uh, we would forsake uh, following after sin and the call of the world and the call of the flesh to go into sin, and that we would rather heed the call of, of you in your word of, of wisdom. Uh, Lord, we know that perfect wisdom is found in you and you alone, and so we pray that we would be drawn to you and be drawn to your word uh, as we are drawn towards wisdom. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So tonight we're looking at the strange and the wise. You can see there on your notes, kind of an interesting uh, topic to look at, but I hope that it's a blessing and helpful to you men. Uh, in Scripture, in, in, the, in the book of Proverbs, um, right, right from the gate, there's, uh, there's actually a warning. Uh, if you would open in your Bibles uh, first with me uh, to Proverbs chapter 1. <clears throat> Proverbs 1, uh, it says in, uh, in chapter, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and discipline, to understand the sayings of understanding, to receive discipline that leads to insight, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the youth, knowledge and discretion. Uh, let the wise man hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire guidance. To, uh, to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and the riddles. And it begins with this. Uh, this is said to be the... Uh, if, if wisdom is a home then chapter 1, verse 7 is uh, the steps uh, leading up into the door. It's the, uh, the, the, the threshold. It says, The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Ignorant fools despise wisdom and discipline. The, uh, the point of Proverbs is, to, uh, is twofold. One, to show you the danger and the foolishness of rejecting the wisdom of God. And two is to show you the benefit of wisdom found in the Word of God, as well as to provide you actual wisdom from God to guide your steps and your thoughts. Uh, I've said this before, but if, if um, you were to look back in old times, uh, the first decades and centuries uh, following the uh, Tyndale and the writing of uh, the Bible, uh, and especially uh, in the 1600s and 1700s, uh, when it was available widely in English, you had farmers and workers, just your common folk, having a Bible for the first time in their lives. And what you would find if you were to go up to them, they would have the Bible on them. They would have a copy of the Bible near them, if not in their home. And there was something um, conspicuous about their Bibles was that uh, in the book of Proverbs, if you were to hold up their Bible, like right there, right in the middle, it was all wrinkly and worn. You could tell that those pages were, 
more used in the other pages of the Scripture. And it was because uh, these, especially the men of those times, they, they wanted desperately to understand how to live. Um, if you think about it, they, a lot of them were first-generation believers, maybe second. And so they didn't have very many good examples in their lives of what it meant to be a Christian. They often were on their own in these things um, and just kind of figuring out what it was to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and so they wanted to know desperately how to live, how to function in this world. And uh, the result of that hunger and that drive to understand the wisdom of God uh, drove them to wear out and, and uh, use greatly the, the pages of the book of Proverbs. And that's because the book of Proverbs is all about how to live. It's all about what to do in any given situation. And uh, if you turn with me to... Proverbs chapter 7, we're going to be looking at Proverbs 7 and Proverbs 8 tonight. And it, it falls in line with that twofold purpose and effect of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, which is to warn you against rejecting God's wisdom and then enticing you and showing you the benefit and the value, the worth uh, of following God's wisdom. So chapter 7 is going to be the warning against folly and sin. And uh, chapter 8 is going to be about the, the blessings and the value of the wisdom of God. And this is done because Proverbs is written, as we just read in Proverbs 1, because the book is primarily written to young men, uh, to men who are either newly married or not yet married, especially to future rulers, to future leaders. That is who the book of Proverbs is written to. And because it's written to that audience, uh, the author of, of, of Proverbs, the authors of Proverbs, um, they present uh, the, the two options of rejecting God's wisdom and, and heading and going headlong into sin or heeding God, God's wisdom and walking in righteousness, he presents those two options as two different women. And that's what we find in Proverbs 7 and Proverbs 8. Proverbs 7 presents to us the strange woman. The strange woman. If you will read along with me, follow along with me as I read verses 1 through 5. It says, My son, keep my words. And treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your intimate friend in order to keep you from the strange woman, from the foreign woman, who flatters with her words. So you can see here in the in the first introduction of chapter seven, here that there's a there's a solemn warning that's given to men. And the solemn warning is it comes at the end of, of verse five or in verse five. But before he gives that warning, he he lays before us uh, the importance of of the word of God in your life. Notice, uh, he says, keep my words, treasure my commandments within you. Now this is a father, this is a godly father speaking to his son. And a godly father that wants uh, to pass on wisdom to his son will pass on not his own wisdom, but the wisdom of God. And so we see that the words of God, the commands of God, are to be kept, that is, guarded, uh, to be treasured, he says, to be highly valued. And he says, keep my commandments and live. So there's incentive to 
keeping the word of God. There's incentive to being in the word every day. Because in the word of God is found life. And he says, it's interesting, he says, uh, keep my commandments and live, verse 2, and my, and my law as the apple of your eye. Now that's saying the apple, the apple of your eye is used today, and it's used in a different way, though. Um, it's it's, it's, it's uh, how we use that phrase today is more affection, right? It has more of the, the idea of, you know, some lady is the apple of your eye. That is, uh, she's precious to you or whatever it might be. But the original intent of this phrase, what it means is the apple of your eye is the pupil of your eye. And what he's saying here is not to treasure it as the apple of your eye, but he says, keep. Keep my commandments and live. And it's, just, it's assumed, keep my law as the apple of your eye. That's the main verb. So he's saying, keep my law as the apple of your eye. Keep the law of God as a pupil of your eye. Now, one of the most important uh, parts of your body to protect is the pupil of your eye. If you think about it, if you, are, if you don't guard your eye, then what happens? It can get injured, and then what? You're, you're blind, right? And you can't see, and it affects your whole life. So the command here is to guard the Word of God, to protect it as, as your own body protects your eyesight. Think about it. I mean, uh, an eyelash or a, a piece of dust or rock gets into your eye and everything stops, right? Uh, you're riding the bike, you're running, or you're doing whatever. You're just walking down the street and something falls in or flies into your eye. Everything stops. Nothing else matters in that moment. And every, all your attention is towards getting that out. Why? Because it's so important. And your body knows it. It's just instinctual. So must our treatment of the Word of God be in our hearts. We need to be, men, you, you need to be treasuring the Word of God, storing it up in your heart and in your mind, and guarding it. That is, putting it under lock and key, protecting it from being violated by your conduct, but also protecting it and, and keeping it so that it doesn't fly away out of your mind. You need to be memorizing Scripture, reading Scripture each day. It needs to be one of your most valued possessions in your life. Guard it. He says, uh, to say to wisdom, you are my sister, call understanding your intimate friend. That is, to be closely acquainted with wisdom. Your relationship with the Word of God and the wisdom of God should be intimate and familiar. Maybe you don't know all the, you know, all the verses of the Bible. Maybe you can't quote verses exactly, or maybe you know what it says, but not the address, or know the address, but not exactly what it says. Whatever your situation might be, you need to make it a, an effort of your life to get more and more familiar with the Word of God. Now, all of this, this valuing and getting familiar with and guarding and treasuring up of the Word of God in your heart and mind, these are all preventative measures. This is the wise man's proactive uh, uh, efforts against sin. Why? Verse 5, in order to keep you from the strange woman, from the foreign woman who flatters with her words. So treasure the word of God, store it up, protect it, value it, um, treat it as your, your eyeball, um, uh, be familiar with the word of God and the wisdom of God so that you don't go to the strange woman. Now, the question is, is he talking about an actual woman or is he talking about whatever the opposite of wisdom is? I would say the most immediate, the most immediate application is 
is your treatment to women who aren't your wife. That's going to be the most immediate application of chapter 7, is uh, the adulterous woman. And in some translations, she's actually called the adulterous woman here. That's going to be the main application. But the principle of this is, in contrast to wisdom, there is, there is sin and evil and folly. In contrast to the wisdom of God and the woman of the wisdom of God in chapter 8, you have here this foolish woman. and She's actually called that in chapter 9, but we don't have time for that. So what we're going to talk about here, the, the main application of this chapter, chapter 7, is going to be how do you guard yourself as a man against immorality, adultery, and everything that comes with sexual sin. That's going to be the main application. And it's, it's just right there in, in, in the text. But downstream of that, you can fill in any other sin because sin is enticing. And it uses the same tactics that this sinful woman does. So any temptation of life, whether it's to anger or bitterness or resentment or pride or covetousness or materialism or uh, anything else, uh, you, can, you can input these principles into those temptations and how sin entices us towards forsaking God, to rejecting God's way for our life and following our own. But first of all, the, the, the main thing that you need to be aware of is the danger of aimlessness. Look at verse 6 to 8. For at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the simple and discerned among the sons a young man lacking a heart of wisdom. Verse 8, passing through the street near her corner. And he strides along the way to her house. Now the her, her corner, her house, that's the strange woman. That's the foreign woman. Strange is, this, is the same word that's used uh, when, uh, when strange fire was offered up to God. And it was rejected. It's unfitting. It's out of place. And the foreign woman... Uh, what he means by foreign is an outsider. Now, this doesn't simply mean a non-Jew. Of course, this means any woman who doesn't follow after God. Outside of the community of the people of God. We would say in our New Testament vernacular, uh, the unsaved or the unregenerate woman. So the strange woman is the woman who is not your wife. And that's applicable if you're, even if you're not married, right? If she's not your wife, uh, then she is not yours to have in this way. As well as the foreign woman who is, in, who is outside of the covenant people of God, outside of, the, of those who are believers, an unsaved woman, you are not to pursue that woman either. But... The danger of aimlessness here in, in verse 6 to 8. Again, notice the, notice the difference here between the wise, where the wise man is located and where the fool is located, this man, this young man that he sees. right? Because he says, at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice. So it's speaking in the first person, right? It's, he's recounting one night, and he's speaking in poetry, right? So he's, he's, he's telling a story, and he's saying, I was home, and I saw this young man walking the streets. So that's the, that's the first thing that we can learn from this. The wise man is the man who stays home. And the fool is the one who wanders in the streets. Now, and then the application of that is, is, is numerous and doesn't simply mean you can't leave your house. But you need to understand that your home, whether it's your home or your parents' home, 
is where you ought to, that's your home base. And that's where you should spend the bulk of your time. Because there are responsibilities within the home. Of course, you have to go to work, right? And you have to earn uh, a paycheck to support uh, your home, the people there, to provide, uh, to support the work of Christ in the church. Of course, you have to do that. But outside of that, your primary sphere of existence is the home. And you can wander the streets, though, uh, from your own living room, from your, from your own bedroom, right? How do we do that? How do we, how do we wander the world around us uh, while we're still at home? The internet. the internet. Yeah, whatever device you have, you can be home but wandering the streets, right? That is what you ought not to do. So surfing the web, scrolling endlessly, that is actually not being the wise man. That's being the young fool here. And he calls him simple. I, I saw among the simple. Now, we learned this uh, a few months ago. Simple means open-minded, not committed. It comes from the word to be open, spacious, and wide. So it's the idea of someone who is mentally and spiritually aimless, a drifter, a wanderer. Of soul. This is the quality of being aimless in any area of life, whether it's your mind, aimless with your money, aimless with your time, aimless with your relationships, aimless with your work, aimless with your plans for the future, whatever it might be. If you're aimless in any area of life, that area of your life and most likely the rest of your life will lead to ruin. That's what he's saying here. Your place is to take care of the responsibilities of your home first, men. Don't be a, this young man who lacks a heart of wisdom, just wandering the streets of the world, just living life aimlessly. Thinking without direction. Watching entertainment without any kind of filter or direction or purpose. Just letting one episode roll into the next of whatever you're watching. That is aimlessness and that's dangerous. We also see here the lie of anonymity. Look at verse 9 and 10. In the twilight, in the evening of that day, in the middle of the night... And in the thick darkness, and behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. Notice when the man is wandering the streets. It's when it's dark, right? And there's actually a progression here. He says, in the twilight, and then in the evening of the day, and then in the middle of the night, and then in the thick darkness. So see how when you're aimless, time just flies by, right? Have you ever experienced that? You're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and then you look up and it's like, oh, I got to go to work tomorrow, right? Or you're just watching and watching, or uh, you're, you, know, you are just living week to week, and there's no purpose. There's no thoughtful direction of life. And just the weeks just fly by and the months fly by and the years go by and you look back and what do I have to show for it? Men, don't let time just fly by. Be purposeful with each hour of the day. When I was discipling uh, young men in youth ministry and college ministry, very early on in my times with them, I would print out a weekly calendar with every hour of the day accounted for. And I said, plan your week. Plan when you're going to sleep. Plan when you're going to work. Plan when you're going to do your school and your homework. And plan when you're going to go to church. Plan when you're going to meet for discipleship. Plan when you're going to read your Bible. Plan when you're going to pray. Plan when you're going to eat. When you're going to shower. 
All of it. I want to see all of your life here on this paper. And then what they found is if they are faithful to plan out their responsibilities, one, they don't have much free time, and two, they're more purposeful with that free time. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe you need to plan out your life a little better. Maybe you need to to actually put pen to paper and think about how you spend your time. But we also see in verses 9 and 10 that in this dark shroud of anonymity, of, of, of the, this, this veil of darkness, you know, there, there's something about the dark that brings things out of us that would normally stay hidden in the daytime. Have you noticed that with sin? Why, is, why are certain clubs or bars, or establishments dark inside? There's a reason for that. Why, are, uh, why do, you know, whatever, the discotecas, why do they only happen at night? There's a reason for that. Where you find darkness, you find men more prone to sin. Is that the time when you are most vulnerable? then you need to be on guard in those special hours. In the early mornings, in the late nights, take steps so that you cannot do what you wouldn't normally do in the light. But this man is wandering this recent night, but notice so is the woman, right? So is the strange woman. I mean, so what does that say about her? Right? She's just as foolish. She is just as aimless and empty and, and uh, 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 open and wayward in her conduct and in her mind, just as he is. What's happening here is both this young man and this adulterous woman, this strange woman, they are, they are both believing the lie that since it's dark, no one can see what they're doing. So that's why she comes to him in the dark. That's why he's out there in the dark. Because there is this this assumption of nobody will see me, nobody will know. Brothers, don't believe that lie. God knows. God sees. Your sin is not anonymous. Notice also this woman's dress you can tell she's dressed like a harlot, he says. So what that means is she is dressed in a way she's marketing herself to the highest bidder. Men, especially young men, if you're not married, if you find a woman or if you see a woman who is marketing herself in this way, you need to keep your distance. If you're truly following after God, and if you're truly thinking wisely, you will see a woman, even within the confines of of a church service, you'll find women who are dressed immodestly. That's not wisdom. That's not wisdom. Those aren't the quality of women that you should desire. The woman who dresses immodestly is marketing herself for the highest bidder. And what happens is women who dress immodestly attract losers. That's what happens. So if you have a daughter or someone or a young woman that you care about who's single, maybe you ought to have a conversation with her and tell her, if you dress like that, you attract certain men. But if you dress modestly, and if, the, if your adornment is the inner person of the heart, as it says in 1 Peter 3, then you will attract godly men. And that's the kind of men that I want for you. So she dresses herself, marketing herself for the highest bidder. And what's the cost? Your soul. That's the cost. This woman is also... She's described as unrestrained, verse 11 and 12. It says, She is boisterous and rebellious. 
Her feet do not dwell at home, stepping in the streets, stepping in the squares, and near every corner she lies in wait. She is boisterous, that means unruly. The, the, the word here denotes uh, or implies a ceaselessness, a restless movement. It's the opposite behavior of that of the peaceful woman of 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Uh, and it says that she is rebellious or defiant is another word for that. It indicates her rebellion against modesty, decency, and especially the word of God. She's rebellious against God. And she's restless. Right? She's going from place to place. It describes all these places. The streets, the squares, near every corner, she lies in wait. This is... This woman is uh, what we would call a busybody. She is a woman that is not content with the role of wife and mother that God has appointed for her. You don't want that kind of woman. You don't want that kind of wife. You want a woman who is content with the role of wife and mother who wants to be home. And notice that she waits like a predator, waits for her prey. She lies in wait. That wording is the wording of, uh, of an animal, of a predator who is lying in wait, ready to pounce on its prey. So in, in that wording, there's danger, right? There's, uh, there's the, the true intentions of her heart are hidden, just as uh, a lion would hide itself under the brush of the, of, the, of the field, would hide itself, crouch itself, lie in wait, and wait for the, the animal, the deer or the antelope or whatever it might be, would wait for it to get too close and would pounce in order to kill. This woman, uh, her true intentions are hidden from the man. And this is especially dangerous because there's this deceitful veneer or facade of piety, of godliness. Notice verse 13 and 15. Excuse me, yeah, 13 through 15. Uh, so she seizes him and kisses him, and with a brazen face she says to him, the sacrifices of peace offerings are with me. Today I paid my vows. Therefore I have come out to meet you, to seek your face earnestly, and I have found you. So what you see here is she's brazen. That's shameless. There's shamelessness to her in seducing the man. There is a shameless uh, uh, attitude to her. Yet, she covers that shame with a false piety, a false religion. This is seen in the fact that she says the right things, right? She says the right religious words. She does the right religious acts, doesn't she? Men, just because somebody warms a seat on a Sunday doesn't mean that she's a godly woman, right? And that's a good start, but that's not enough. And so it is for you as, as a man. Just because you warm a seat and say the right religious Christianese words, and just because you do the right Christian things, doesn't make you a godly man, right? Right? But notice how she feeds the man's ego. It's, it's amazing. I have come out to meet you, to seek your face earnestly, and I have found you. She treats him like a prize that she's found. And man, it's, uh, I'll tell you what, it's nice when a, uh, a woman 
right? Especially a pretty woman strokes your ego, isn't it? It it sure would be uh, enticing for that woman to look at you that way or to talk to you in a way where she praises you and lauds you. She's feeding the man's pride. She knows exactly what men want. Men want to be valued. Men want to be respected. Men want to be uh, 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 praised and honored. And she's giving him that. She's giving him what he wants. But just because a lady likes you or wants to be with you, that is not an open door from God. Right? That's not what it means. Now, this lady, she, this, this uh, strange woman, this adulterous woman, she knows how to entice this man. Verse 16 to 18. She entices him, going after the lust of the flesh. Look, verse 16 to 18. I have spread my couch with coverings, with covered linens of Egypt. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come then, let us drink our fill as lovers until morning. Let us delight ourselves with the pleasures of love. So the adulterous woman, the woman that you need to be on guard against, is the woman who does play to the physical senses of the man. Right? Doesn't she do that? Her couch is covered with with coverings. Right? So that's a sense of touch. Colored linens of Egypt, that was a, that was a deep red uh, linen from Egypt. That was very rare and luxurious. So that's the sense of the eyes. I sprinkle my bed with, with all of these fragrant aromas. So that's a sense of smell. So she feeds, she, she, she uh, capitalizes on uh, men's tendency to be uh, very physical, let's say. But yet for her, the reality is that that physical nature of what she's enticing the man to, that is the depth of the relationship as far as she's concerned. Merely physical. How do we know that? Well, because in verse 19 it says she's already married. So she has no intent of a relationship She has no intent of true love. She has no intent of caring for this man or being wedded to this man. She has no intent of fidelity. It's merely physical. And men, you need to be on guard against the physical. Because women know that that is how most men are oriented. You need to guard your heart. You need to guard your eyes. Careful what you look at. Uh, don't think that you're stronger than you are. You are not strong. Christ doesn't strengthen you uh, in your spiritual walk and mature you with the intent that you, that you would expose yourself to sin and be able to, quote-unquote, handle it. I'm talking about music, shows, Movies, I'm talking about those things, places you go, things you look at. God doesn't grow you to, to this godly state to where, it, you know, I don't struggle with, you know, lust. So I can go and watch all these lustful movies. He doesn't grow you so that you can partake of sin, right? Think about it. He grows you so that you abstain from sin, doesn't he? So this, this, this thinking, and it's popular in churches, this thinking of, you know, I've grown, and I don't struggle with that. I'm stronger. It doesn't bother me. That's not, it's not spiritual maturity. It's spiritual immaturity. What's happening to you, what's happened to you is not that you've grown past that, but you've grown dull. You've grown calloused to sin. And that's much worse. So she offers physical satisfaction while withholding the spiritual fulfillment of true love. Men, you need to think of love as not 
physical. You need to think of love as spiritual first and foremost. That's why the physical intimacy in a marriage is sweeter and better than the physical intimacy of immorality. It's because it's it's predicated, it is founded on the foundation of a spiritual love, a spiritual commitment between husband and wife. That's why there is more delight there. And that's why the, the author of Proverbs in Proverbs 5 says, you can have your fill of that. Drink to the full of that, sure, but not here. Don't go to this cistern. Now, she not only plays to the lust of the flesh, but she also uh, promotes this lie that there's nothing to fear. Verse 19 and 20. For my husband is not at home. She has gone on a journey far away. He took a bag of silver in his hand. On the day of the full moon, he will come home. So this is the, the delusion of escape, right? Come and partake of this sin. Here it's, it's immorality, sexual immorality. But it can be any sin, fill in the blank, right? Any temptation, fill in the blank. And the lie is you can partake of this and there's no consequences. That's the lie. Men, there are always consequences to your sin. Always. Doesn't matter how private it is, doesn't matter how socially acceptable it is, there is always a consequence. The lie here is that there's nothing to fear. There's, don't worry, my husband, the one who you should fear, he's gone. And he's, he's going to be gone for a while. The reality is that the husband is not the only one that the man should fear, right? Who should the man fear? God. Why? Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. See how it all ties together? Men, you should not be so concerned about, well, is this illegal or not? Is this socially acceptable or not? Will I get caught or not? Your main concern is what would my Savior and God have me do? That needs to be your concern. Think of Him first. And she, again, entices Him and tricks Him, fools Him with flattery. Verse 21 to 23. With her abundant persuasions, she entices Him. With her flattering lips, she derives, she drives Him to herself. He suddenly follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as one in fetters to the discipline of an ignorant fool until an arrow pierces through his liver as a bird hastens to the snare and he does not know that it will cost him his soul. So here are the flattering words, the persuasive words, the flattering words are smooth words. That's literally what flattery is. The flattering words means smooth words. Those words that go down easy, right? The words that are so nice and sweet. Men, uh, if, you, if there's a woman that tells you how great and awesome you are, I'm, I'm not talking about you know a, a godly wife encouraging you in your function, in, in, in your role and in your life. I'm not talking about that, but just flattery, right? Outright just saying nice things to make you feel good and to make you accept them. Uh, You need to be on guard against the woman who who only speaks flattering things to you. You need to look for a woman and want a woman and cultivate, if you're married, cultivate a woman, cultivate a wife, who doesn't always agree with you, who doesn't always tell you how great you are and wonderful you're doing. You need a woman who disagrees with you within the confines of biblical disagreement, of course, uh, who might have a different take on things than you do. You need to find a woman who isn't afraid to say, you know what, you sinned 
And uh, that's not okay. And to hold you accountable, to seek forgiveness from her, that's the kind of woman that you want. Because that is the woman who will make you better, will make you more into the image of Christ. But this woman doesn't do that. She is flattering. Her words are smooth and nice, easy. Uh, she has all the answers to why it's okay uh, for you to be with her. She's convincing to the simple fool because he has no, he's not, you know, he has no filter, no grid of the word of God. And so what does he do? He follows her to his own death. And uh, there's, there's three ways, right? As, as the ox goes to slaughter, uh, some translations have, at the end of verse 22, as a stag, uh, as a stag uh, falls into the, uh, into the fetters or into the entanglement or into the trap. And then uh, the bird in the snare. There's these three images of trapping animals or killing animals give three qualities to the, to the danger of this adulterous woman. Her trap is thoroughly destructive because the ox is led to slaughter, right? It's a violent death. Her trap is inescapable just as a stag is ensnared. And her trap is swift. It's quick. Right? That adulterous woman will, will, will spring the trap just like that before you have time to rethink things. It comes quickly. And the fool here fails to see. And here, here, here's the, 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 one of the main issues. This fool, this simple man, fails to see the connection between sin and death. Right? What does the New Testament tell us about the relationship between sin and death? Anybody know a verse that has sin and death? And... Yes, what does it say? The wages of sin is death. Yes. You see, the relationship between sin and death is that sin earns you death. The payment of sin is always death in some form or another. It will kill something in your life. Your sin will kill something in your life if it doesn't kill your own soul. Now there's a final warning here in verses 24 to 27. So now my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart go astray into her ways. Do not wander into her paths. For many are the slain whom she has cast down, and numerous are all those killed by her. The ways to Sheol are in her house, descending to the chambers of death. How, how terrifying that is. So this strange woman waiting on the corner of her house this fool, this wanderer, finds her there. She entices him, lies to him, ensnares him, brings, her, brings him into her home. And he's thinking, oh, I'm going to have a great time, right? That's what he's thinking. It's going to be a great night tonight. I'm going to enjoy myself. But he doesn't know as soon as that door closes behind him, he's in the lobby of hell. So the warning, men is stay away. <laughs> Run. What does it say in the New Testament? Flee immorality, right? It doesn't say, see how close you can get before crossing the line. doesn't say that. It says, run in the opposite direction. What does that mean? Don't play with uh, sexual sin. Don't play with lust. Don't play, and if we broaden this application, don't play with sin. Don't play with temptation. If there might be an opportunity of temptation, don't go there. Don't do that. Don't watch it, whatever it needs to be. 
If there, if there could be an opportunity of temptation, run. Especially when it comes to this sin, immorality. The, the, the point is, notice he says, uh, many are the slain she has cast down, uh, and numerous are all those killed by her. The point is, you need to come to terms with, you are not the exception to the rule, right? This gets, this, this, this gets them hook, line, and sinker every time. You're not the exception to the rule. Don't think, well, you know, I'm different, or this situation is different. It's not. It's not. Her way leads to death. If you follow after sin, it leads to death. You will ruin your life. You will ruin your soul. And haven't we seen that? Haven't we seen that in our own church? Where men fall away. And they are enticed by sin, and they're just gone, right? They thought they were the exception. They thought they could stand, but they couldn't. Don't be deceived, right? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? I love this. Do not be deceived, right? Don't believe the lie. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So pick your sin. If you mess around with it, if you think that you're the exception to the rule, think again. If you do not kill sin, it will kill you. And you will not inherit the kingdom of God. No. I went way too long on the first point. <laughs> Proverbs 8. I want to give you some homework. I want you to read Proverbs 8 on your own time. Actually, read Proverbs 8 and 9. Because Proverbs 8 is the wise woman's turn. right? Lady wisdom. It's the alternative. right? The way of God. Following after God. So it's interesting. Um, just, just some thoughts. Uh, it's interesting that what we're given is a contrast between a physical woman and a uh, personified woman. We're, we're given the contrast between an actual immoral woman and a concept of wisdom. Right? So... The answer to uh, the, the alternative to following the sinful woman and going into sin and immorality is not, well, just find a woman, find a godly woman. That's part of it. But that's not really the opposite of this. The opposite, what you really should seek for first, is the wisdom of God. You see? And then if you follow and you seek after the wisdom of God, then you go to Proverbs 31 and you find a wise woman, right? Because she fears the Lord. A woman who fears the Lord, is her value is far surpasses rubies, it says, right? That's the woman that you want. So yes, find your godly woman and drink your fill of your godly woman. Uh, but that in and of itself is not enough to, to satisfy your soul and to make it so that you're not going after the strange woman. You need to be in the Word of God. You need to seek the wisdom of God. You need to be in communion with Him through His Scriptures. That's the solution, you see. Now, the invitation of wisdom, just like... The strange woman uh, entices the simple man. So does the, the, the lady wisdom. God calls to us men. And from time to time, we're simple-minded, aren't we? We're a little too open-minded at times. And God says, you know what? You come to me. You come to my word. 
Uh, you want to know what to do? You come to the Word of God. You come and chase after Lady Wisdom. Uh, just, just a couple things I want to highlight before we close. Notice the location. Um, verse, beginning in verse 1. Does not wisdom call and discernment give forth her voice? At the top of the heights upon the way. Where the pathways meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gates, at the opening to the city, at the entrance of the doors, she makes a shout. To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O simple ones, understand prudence, and O fools, understand a heart of wisdom. Notice where she is hanging out. Notice where she is. Where the, uh, she's at the top of the heights upon the way. So she's broadcasting. She, it's an open invitation that God gives to all to come and find wisdom in his word. But notice also where the pathways meet. Beside the gates of the city. At the opening to the city. At the entrance of the doors. What does that mean? It means in the places of life that are pivotal. In those moments, those seasons, those, those situations. Those times where you need to make a decision. You need to make a choice. You need to choose a direction for your life. You need to choose, you need to make a choice between sin and righteousness or God and everything else. At those points, those pivotal moments of your life, wisdom is there calling out. Come to me, I'll show you where to go. I'll lead you on the straight path. See that? And the truth is delightful. Verse 6 through 9. God's truth and wisdom are noble and excellent. Her words are not smooth, but straight. You see, she has a speech that lines up with the truth of God's word, and that should be delightful to God's people. The one who loves truth is the one who hates falsehood and wickedness. And wickedness is anything that's anti-God, anti-humanity, you can trust what wisdom says. It will lead you on the straight path, and you will find great delight for your soul there. Not only that, but verse 10 and 11 tell us to pursue wisdom because it's more valuable than any other earthly treasure. What wisdom has to offer is more valuable than anything the world has to offer. And verse 12 and 13 show us the gifts of wisdom. When you have wisdom, she brings the gifts of prudence, knowledge, and discretion with her. So that means when you seek the wisdom of God in in the word of God, you will be able to think well, you'll be able to understand reality, and you'll be able to plan for the future. Not only that, but but with wisdom comes the washing effect of the word of God where it washes and cleanses away the sins of pride and sinful conduct and evil speech in verse 13. And if you think that you know, there's no uh, usefulness to wisdom, we can see in verse 14 to 16 that there is great power in wisdom because wisdom gives kings, rulers, and leaders the power to lead effectively. So men... Think about it. This was written by a king for the next king, right? Proverbs was. So if the wisdom of God is enough for a man to lead a nation of people, I think it's enough to lead your home with, right? I think think it's, it's up for the task to lead your life, to govern your life and your home. The rewards of wisdom in verse 17 to 21 are countless. Uh, They're enumerated there. Uh, The rewards of wisdom. You see, if wisdom is treasured and loved, then you will be closely associated with it. It says, if you love wisdom, wisdom will love you. What does that mean? That if you treasure wisdom, then you will have this intimate, close, devoted relationship between you and wisdom. That it will be close by you. It will be there for you through thick and thin. If you, but you have to love wisdom. You have to be committed to wisdom. 
You have to be committed to the word of God. You have to be committed to, to thinking and living God's way, not yours. And dignity and respect are normally enjoyed by those who live life God's way. It comes with the territory, usually. We don't preach health, wealth, and prosperity. Uh, we don't preach a prosperity gospel in this church. But there is the reality that the norm is that if you live life God's way, usually it, it will go well with you. You'll be prosperous. doesn't mean that you won't suffer. But God will carry you through the suffering. It doesn't mean that you'll you won't go with that you'll uh, you know drive a Bentley, but you'll have what you need, and you'll find contentment, and life will be smooth, and it will be filled with more harmony than chaos. But the reality is that if you seek God's wisdom for worldly riches alone, if you say, "Well, okay, I'll go to church if I can get this out of it." then what happens is that wisdom, she will abandon you, and you'll just be nothing more than a rich fool. The, the truth is that wisdom's riches are better than silver and gold, though they often come with silver and gold because you live a righteous and good life as God ordains for you in the Word. Though that does usually come with it in some measure. The truth is, Wisdom itself is more valuable than things and riches. And so you seek that first. The spiritual and eternal treasures of God are to be valued above all else. Now the rest of, the, uh, of chapter 8 go on to describe wisdom as being with God in creation. In verses 22 to 29. And what we see there, what we see there, is simply the fact that uh, wisdom uh, was there with God as an attribute of God. Some people say, "Well, this is obviously talking about Jesus." So you just substitute all those personal pronouns and all the the lady wisdom language with Jesus or with Christ, and that's really what it means. Well, there's an element of truth in that because in Christ is the wisdom of God. We know that from Colossians 2. Uh, but uh, this is speaking of the attribute of wisdom in God or of God. So God was wise in creation. That's all it's saying. And God, what it, what it says here is that God had wisdom before he made the earth. And so what that means is God had a plan, a design, a purpose before creating the world. And so we can learn from that as men of God, that wisdom is needed before action is undertaken. So as men of God, seek God's wisdom before you make a decision, before you do something. Don't just wing it. But, but gain God's wisdom ahead of time. And then as you work and, and act and live, uh, then employ the wisdom of God as God employed wisdom in his act of creation. I want to close with the, with, the, with the last few verses of Proverbs 8, verse 32 to 36. So now, O sons, listen to me, for blessed are they who keep my ways. Hear discipline and be wise, and do not neglect it. How blessed is the man who hears me, to watch daily at my doors, to keep watch at my doorposts. For he who finds me finds life, and obtains favor from Yahweh. But he who sins against me does violence to his own soul. All those who hate me love death. Now, men, your pursuit of wisdom, he says here, must be daily. It must be often. It must be unfailing. You need to seek wisdom with endurance. You need to be on the constant search day after day for the wisdom of God in his word. That means you need to read the Bible every day. I mean, the, the, as practical, practical as you can get. 
so many uh, lessons and sermons uh, have just read the Bible as its application because so much of God's Word tells us, read the Bible. It's because uh, we often don't. It's, it's one of, it, after prayer, it's the most neglected spiritual discipline. It shouldn't be that way. It would be like trying to climb Mount Everest without, uh, without food and without oxygen. It is what it's like trying to live your life without prayer and reading the scriptures. You can't do it. It's you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. So pursue wisdom. Don't give up easily. Ask, seek, and knock, it says, doesn't it? And with that pursuit comes a promise. A promise of wisdom is in verse 35 and 36. That if you uh, find wisdom, you find life. To find wisdom is to find life. To have wisdom is to have the favor of God. It doesn't mean that if you read the Bible enough, then God will be pleased with you and he'll save you. That's not what it says. If you find wisdom, you find life. If you have wisdom, you have God's favor. They come hand in hand. And the... The contrast between 35 and 36, verse 35 and 36, is the contrast between life and death, isn't it? So this tells us that how you treat the wisdom of God, how you treat the word of God, is a matter of life and death. That's what it is. You see, men, life does not come to the spiritually neutral. Life does not come to the spiritually neutral. What comes to the spiritually neutral is death. You don't have to try uh, to follow the path of death, to follow the path of spiritual death. You don't have to try. That comes automatic. What you need to try and give every ounce of effort towards is to find Wisdom, obtain it, grasp it, take hold of it. Heed its call, heed her call, Lady Wisdom's call, to come to her, find all that you need. Don't listen to the adulterous woman. Don't listen to temptation. Don't listen to sin. They're full of lies. Find truth in the word of God. Find fulfillment there, find delight there, happiness and life itself. So, man, I, I trust that you are encouraged to be in the Word, that it, it, that it instead of being drawn towards sin and, and tempted towards sin, enticed towards sin, you, you are now instead enticed towards the Word of God. May it draw you this week. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word. I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to mold us, help us to be in your holy scriptures, God, day after day. May we uh, forsake sin, Lord. Oh, Lord, forgive us if any of us are in, uh, entangled in sin today. I pray, Lord, that you would give them a victory over those sins, that you would give them spiritual strength to overcome those temptations. Lord, I pray that they would find their strength in the word of God, that they would run to you in your word and in prayer, that they would fill up their time with being with Lady Wisdom in the scriptures so that they're not wandering the streets of this world. Lord, uh, protect these dear men. Guard them from sin. May they have the Shield of faith, Lord. Faith in your word, faith in your promises. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Just a quick reminder. Uh, next month, December, no redeemed manhood. So we're on break for December. It's a little different than we've done before. But uh, just to kind of clear up your schedules, it's usually a really busy time of the year. So nothing in December. 
We're back on January 16th. There's schedules in the back. If, if you don't have one, you can put it on your fridge or wherever uh, and put it on your calendars. Um, January 6th, we're back, and we're going to be looking at words and relationships. So the power of words in our relationships and how God gives us wisdom with how we speak to one another, beginning in our home and then branching out into all those different relationships in our lives. All right? Uh, there's snacks in the back, coffee, 